Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this evening for our live stream event, Embergen Demo, Creating Simulations in Real Time. My name is Bo Jansen, and I'm Education Lead here at Noman. And it's with great honor I'll be hosting this event and introducing our guests this evening. But before I introduce them, a couple of quick announcements. First, I want to thank Lenovo and AMD for sponsoring this event. Lenovo and AMD help us continue to bring these free educational events to you. So as always, uh, thank you to them. Um, there'll be a uh, closed captions on our Facebook page. If you want to follow along with, with closed captions, we'll be streaming there. And once the event is over, we'll be archiving this event on our YouTube and Twitch channels. So with that said, I um, want to introduce our guest here this evening, uh, Jenga FX founder and CEO, Nick Sievert. So Nick is an entrepreneur and VFX artist who is currently the founder and CEO of Jenga FX. Nick got his start modding games in 2006 and quickly fell in love with creating visual effects for games. After spending far too much time waiting for simulations and renders, he started Jenga FX in 2016 to offer real-time visual effects tools to the game and film industries. Nick also had a professional stint in the games industry as a VFX artist at Funcom. So welcome, Nick. Thank uh, you. Great to have you here. I'm glad to be on the stream and oh, show off Embergen for you guys. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, as someone who goes back doing uh, fluid simulations for a long time and is used to, um, uh, I'm going to sit off a sim before I go to lunch, uh, put it on <laughs> yeah. the farm. Uh, I, I've been pretty uh, blown away with Embergen here, and it's, it's good to get it out uh, here for our students and the sort of the Noman community. Um, I don't want to sound sycophantic in this question, but what made you think you could do this? Well, I mean, I was waiting for simulations, like you said. I'd set it, and for me, it was overnight because I didn't have a very good computer. And then I'd wake up in the morning, found out that it crashed, and I just knew that I had to fix it. That's how I knew. I just had the intuition and the thought, um, the forethought, I guess, to say, you know what? I really bet that I can make this one real time and I can make it stable. I can put it on the GPU and make it really fast. And I don't know, I just had the uh, the conviction, <laughs> I guess is the, the word. I was like, I, I have to change this because I know if I'm dealing with this much of a struggle with these tools, that there's everyone else is probably dealing with it too. And so I have to do it for everyone else is kind of my, my idea. So that's kind of how I figured that I could do it was... She's like, man, I have to do this. And so just with that conviction. Yeah. The <laughs> that, sheer that brute force of will. I'm going to make yeah. the voxels work whether they want to or not. Exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Um, let's see. I think we have, uh, for those in the audience who may not be familiar with Embergen, we do have um, a bit of a demo reel um, of some of the work. If you, uh, We can call it up and check out some of the uh, real-time work in Embergen. All right. idea that that was done in real time um mm -hmm. some of the things you could say well okay they could have pre-sim that and put that on a card other things you think well maybe that's a cinematic that they just sort of canned <laughs> but didn't do that in real time um uh just kind of curiosity when trying to tackle this again just having the conviction that you want to do it um 
what was the process like to try to technically streamline and economize out this whole uh, fluid sim process? So uh, for me, basically, I said, you know, I, I tried to do some some prototyping stuff uh, by myself and quickly found out that I was not uh, up to par for the job. So I brought on my co-founder, his name is Morton, and um, he was a guy who basically worked in like the uh, research for the oil industry and stuff like that in Norway. And uh, but he was a computational physicist. And I said, Morton, you know, what do you think about doing this kind of thing? And, and the reason why like I wanted somebody like him instead of somebody from the industry is because I was scared that if I got somebody from the industry, they would be stuck in what I would consider like the old ways of doing things. And so I was like, well, let me create a completely fresh team of people who are not even in the industry. And then we can go forth and, and prosper, so to speak. And so that's kind of what I did. And it's worked out very well. And like at this point now, we've hired people from the industry and stuff like that. But um, whenever we were starting out, it was just like, let me create a clean slate and and get my idea out there and let's see what we can do um, to build this software. And so that's kind of what the process was like there. No, no, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, how much of a um, sort of culture shock was it to get people who are just into raw computational data processing to see how the world of real time game engines work? Well, I think that the good news was, is that at least in like Morton's case, um, they were already interested in that kind of thing. And whenever I was like, hey, what do you think about this? They're like, oh, yeah, let's let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> and so, you know, I guess th they had similar conviction whenever I showed them the problem that we were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And they're like, OK, I, we have to be a part of this. We have to, you know, join the team and, and do this kind of thing. And so, you know, I was really lucky that it was such a, you know, a, I guess a a hard problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And because it's such a big challenge, they're like, okay, you know, we're up for it. And so that's kind of the, the route that we went. Oh, very cool. And saying a uh, team from Norway, has JangFX been remote for most of its uh, life? We, or? we are completely remote. We do not have an office. <laughs> and, oh, so, nice. and right now we have uh, 15 employees right this second. Very cool. So the lockdown didn't give you much of a hiccup then? No, no hiccups. We, we've been remote and on Discord uh, from day one, basically. Oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Uh, so you have, um, uh, talking about hypothetically here, I want to show us some of your, um, some of your uh, demos of the software. We'd love to see it. All right, cool. cool. I am ready. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Alrighty, so this is uh this is Embergen, and now let me hide this little widget here. Okay, so this right here is Embergen. This is uh, our latest build, 075, and this is version pre four. And so um, if you go to our website, you can't actually download this. You have to be a licensed user and in our Discord to get this build. So uh, just if somebody's out there and they're like, hey, I'm gonna go download this and try this exact thing, well, it's not exactly released yet uh, to the public. Um, but for licensed users, it is. Um, so without without out of the way, uh, I can go ahead and go over some things. Um, so in this case, this is just showcasing a new node that we have uh, called Burst. And uh, essentially, it creates a bunch of little shapes, and then you can burst your emitters and stuff like that. Um, and I will open up another project. Um, so may, maybe something like a massive explosion here. And so in this case, we've got some keyframes uh, to start temperature and emit fuel before we actually ignite it. And you can see here the explosion going through and kind of animating. And so just to show that it's real time, you know, I can go through, pan the camera around, um, you know, do whatever I want. I can, you know, come in here and say, um, let's bring in like a collider and uh, we'll pan over on the node graph here and do like another primitive. And then, uh, you know, we can come in here and interact with the smoke and whatever you can kind of see the smoke being pushed around and whatnot. This particular preset is very heavy <laughs> in this case. Um, the simulation size is about 61 million voxels. And so, uh, and I'm also on a 3090, so I don't want to, uh, you know, say that you can do this on like a 970 or, you know, a 950 or something like that, uh, an older card. So you do need a newer card. But in general, our, um, what we try and get the benchmark for is around a 1060 or a 1070 for uh, basic simulations. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, so, uh, 
I'll show you a couple more presets of kind of what Imogen can do um, uh, inside of uh, like our presets. And then what I, my plan is, is I'm going to show you guys uh, how to make a couple simulations from scratch. So we're going to do like a, a dust implosion. Um, and then we're going to do maybe uh, some fire. And if we have time, we'll do uh, some GPU particle stuff to show that uh, like this, uh, we don't do just voxels. You can do things uh, similar to like the program Krakatoa, where you can do GPU particles and, you know, all kinds of neat effects for those kind of things too. Um, so yeah, uh, this right here is one of my favorites that we that we recently made. It's like an alien cloudscape. And then uh, one of the other ones that I'll show is maybe um, like this uh, fake uh, waterfall type thing. So this isn't actually water, it's just smoke that we <laughs> kind of hacked into making it look, look like water. But it's actually cool, like all the different things that you can do. Um, and so now that you uh, have seen like some of the things in our demo reel and uh, some of our presets here, and also if you do end up downloading like our build from our website, we have like a hundred, I think it's 104 presets. And so one of the big things you want to do is um, make sure that whenever you download the software, you have at least a hundred things that you can look at and see what's possible in the software that we've all created. Um, and basically, whenever you start the software, I mean, it's literally instantly on fire. And so we wanted something to show up in the viewport right from the get go, because I don't think a, a blank viewport is uh, very intuitive. So that's kind of how we built the software. We want it to be super easy for anybody to be able to use. And uh, without further ado, I'll go through a little tutorial on how we can make like a shockwave um, from say like a, a meteor hitting the ground or a, a big heavy crate or something like that. Probably more like a crate or something like that falling out the sky and hitting, you know, a pile of sand in the desert or something. So it's kind of where we're going to go and uh, we'll see where it takes us. So uh, a little bit of explanation about the node workflow of Imogen. So it's really quite simple. Um, we do kind of keep things in sort of a black box. We hope to open up things a little bit in the future. Um, but right this second, you know, if you want access to, you know, uh, you know, buoyancy or turbulence or vorticity, wind, you know, things like that, gravity, uh, you have access to all of those different things. You can change your simulation uh, infection methods. So we have BFECC and Simulagrangian, um, things like that. So you have access to all of those things. And we also just added a node tree uh, actually today, uh, where you can go through and, and uh, like actually choose different nodes uh, through a node tree, things like that. So um, the way that it works is you have a shape primitive and you basically say, hey, you know, I am defining what I want to, you know, emit from. So it could be a cone or, you know, a sphere, a box, whatever you can. Uh, it's all uh, SDF. So you can do like a shape blend, come through here and add like a noise to it. And we'll add this into our emitter. And now we have like a noisy sphere. And then from there, we have like a noise preview. You can change like the scale of the noise. Uh, you can animate the noise. You can kind of do um, whatever you want. One thing I will note is this is just kind of our, our default um, setup of just, uh, I guess, like mid-range parameters. Uh, it's not specifically supposed to look good right off the get-go. It's just kind of uh, parameters that are in a middle range um, just to get your simulation started. Um, and so uh, with that, so the other thing we have is an emitter. And basically, your emitter just says, hey, how much fuel am I emitting into the simulation? Uh, how much smoke am I emitting into the simulation? And what is the temperature that I'm injecting into the simulation as well? Uh, you can have multiple emitters. Uh, you can have multiple shapes in an emitter. You can kind of do um, whatever you want uh, in that regard, which is really awesome. Um, and then we also have colliders. So you can quickly add in a collider. And it can be a mesh, an animated mesh, um, really anything you want. And so you bring that in, and then you can have it colliding with your smoke. And then if it is moving, uh, in the case of an animated mesh or something, you can have like a velocity transfer and transfer that velocity over to the simulation, and it will, you know, update in real time for you. You can also uh, make colliders emit light, and uh, you can have, you know, different occlusion settings and stuff like that. So, you know, if you want like a bar of light or something, uh, we can bring in like a box and, you know, do something like uh, one like this. And now we have like a bar of light kind of going through the simulation. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of how colliders work. Um, and then inside the simulation node, it's going to control everything from, you know, your bounding box size uh, to, you know, your voxel size. Uh, if you want upscaling or not, 
So you can quickly upscale the simulation. It's going to be exactly the same, just higher detail, uh, since everything is deterministic in our software, which is great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we have that. We've also got like the simulation tab where you can choose like infection methods. Uh, we have combustion where you can say like how much smoke is being generated uh, by every unit of fuel burned. Uh, and we also have like more advanced parameters uh, if you really want to get into like the nitty gritty of all of our parameters. Uh, but typically it can just stay uh, within the simple uh, parameters here. Uh, and then you, you have things like vorticity where if there is no vorticity, you have really smooth smoke. And then the higher your vorticity, the more noise and turbulence and stuff that you're going to get. We have large vorticity, which induces like really large eddies and things like that. Um, and then uh, it finally transitions into our volume node. And the volume node basically says, hey, I want to kind of voxelize all of the data that I have. Um, and from there, you can do uh, various post-processing things. So you can uh, sharpen the simulation if you want. And the cool thing is, is that anything that you do in the volume node is actually going to be uh, exportable as a VDB. So if you sharpen it inside of Embergen, or you know, you come through here and you say, hey, you know, I want to do like negative dilation or you know, positive dilation or whatever. Um, if you do that kind of thing, uh, that will export to your VDB if you're working with film stuff, um, which is pretty cool. And then we also have uh, some really advanced stuff for modulation. So you can take basically any of our uh, data types and then modulate it onto a, another data type. Um, and so we probably won't really go through much of that today because it's a pretty deep topic. Um, but then uh, from there, we have the shading node, which is going to determine uh, what your renderer looks like. And so in most cases, you know, if you're just trying to export VDBs, probably doesn't really matter uh, what your shading and stuff looks like because you're going to shade it somewhere else. But if you are using our renderer and our compositing tools or you're trying to export to a game uh, with our flipbook editor and stuff like that, then you definitely want to uh, learn about the shading node. And uh, from there, you know, you can quickly uh, make some pretty decent looking fire. So you can say, hey, you know, I want uh, flames translucency and or whatever. Uh, we have different scattering settings. So you can say, is the sunlight affecting my smoke? Uh, what uh, light amount is the flames uh, contributing to my smoke? Um, that kind of stuff. You also have, you know, shadowing controls and a whole array of, <laughs> of other things. And then uh, you have like your lighting that, that plugs into that stuff. And then finally, uh, you have the scene node, which basically just says, um, what am I going to do on top of everything that I'm rendering? So uh, you have tone mapping and, you know, you can swizzle colors if you want to. Uh, you can do like uh, some vignette. Uh, I believe that's how you pronounce that. You have style, so you can do, you know, pixelized stuff if you want. You can do chromatic aberration. Uh, if you wanted to, to render that for some reason, uh, you can do all that kind of stuff. Um, inside of our scene node. And then finally, which is the most important node of all, uh, at least whenever you want to export, is the render node. And that's whenever you get access to all of our different channels. So if we go over to the render tab, you can see we have like a, a crosshair of kind of like where the center of the frame is and that kind of thing. Um, and we have a bunch of different um, export types. We have just tons and tons of stuff that you can export from ambient lights to just your scattering um, to motion vectors um you know we've also got like uh your, your normal map uh if you wanted that if you want to do six point lighting we have access to do uh six point lights uh you can export just your alpha or really anything that you need for uh export types we pretty much cover and if we don't let us know <laughs> we could probably uh add a pass to make that happen for you um and so yeah so then from there uh, if you just want to generate like a flip book uh so let's just say that for instance we want to go to uh, frame 64 and maybe we wanted um you know yeah let's just say 64 frames since it's an eight by eight and then uh, let me just choose a path here we'll say tester and then uh, we'll just click export now and uh here we go that's how quickly it's generating your flipbook for your game and then uh, you can play it back here in Embergen. and our looping controls don't work just yet that's one of the reasons why we haven't uh released publicly yet but uh other than that, so you can play back your flipbook, uh, go back to it, inspect it, do whatever you want to do uh, for your game if, if you're doing that. Or if you wanted to export you know, a much higher resolution for your film, uh, we do have a um, method to export to like an image sequence as well. Um, and so other than that, now that I've kind of given like the general overview of uh, what Embergen is and, and a little bit on like how it works, um, and I will remove my little grid there or my uh, tree. 
And so let's go ahead and, and try and do a dust explosion. So I'm going to just restart everything, make sure it's from scratch, and uh, we'll, we'll make the dust shockwave. And we're going to imagine that a box or something is kind of falling onto the ground, and then we're going to make that, that shockwave go out. So uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go into my emitter, and I'm going to turn off my fuel emission. And so now we just have uh, some smoke coming from a torus. And for my shape, I am going to make it a sphere, and then I'm probably going to do a blend shape here and we're going to do shape noise and we're going to blend this in here um, and then i am going to scale this up just a little bit something like that uh, and maybe give me like a little bit more gain and uh, a couple more octaves so that it's a bit more noisy so now we have that and uh, i will probably scale that up just a little bit more so now that we have that uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, keyframe the activity of my emitter so that we can uh, get a nice burst. So if you want to keyframe any of our parameters, so what, one of the cool things to note about Embergen is you can expose any parameter that you want to either the timeline or to the node graph. So um, if you wanted to expose them to the node graph, you have all kinds of modulators. So you can do like oscillations or MIDI import, MIDI inputs, math, uh, time shifts and constants and, and just all kinds of stuff uh, if you wanted to uh, expose that kind of data to your node graph. Uh, so you can do that, uh, but in this case, I am just going to keyframe my activity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift click and create my first key uh, at zero. And then uh, I'm probably going to do something like this. this. I think this is frame 12. And so I'm going to pause the simulation and then double click that key. And I'm going to just say that it's not enabled anymore. And so now we just have a burst. And so from there, I'm going to go to my emission and I'm going to really increase my smoke rate um something like this um and then uh what i want to do which uh, i don't want to move my emitter here okay so now i'm going to go to my simulation and i'm going to increase my voxel count uh maybe 256 by 256 by 128 um and then i'm going to click apply new resolution if you are working with Emergen, uh we don't want you to like actually type in a million and then it like automatically compute and then like crash the software so you have to uh, actually click the apply uh, new resolution button uh, if you want to request one from the GPU. Um, so now that we do that, uh, what we can do is go into the simulation and I'm going to turn off buoyancy and I'm going to, add, I guess, max out my smoke wave. And so now we kind of have a little burst like this, which is pretty cool. And then the last thing I'm gonna do in my emitter here is I'm going to turn off my uh, visualizer for my emitter. And so now to get like a radial burst, uh, what we can do is first off, let's kind of increase the amplitude of our uh, force noise that's inside of our, our emitter here. And so one thing to note is that if you have a noise or, or any kind of force plugged into your emitter, the emitter shape, the SDF of it, is actually acting as a mask for that force. So outside of the general shape of the emitter, the force isn't going to be applied anywhere else. Uh, but if you do plug in a force into your simulation, that force is now global. And so what we can do here is we're going to add a force line to our actual simulation node here. And uh, actually, I'm going to add it to my um, to my emitter. And I'm going to turn off my push strength. And then I'm going to make my repel strength maybe 50. And so now we have something kind of like this where we have a outward burst. But one of the things is, is our uh, bounding box is kind of pushing the um, explosiveness of this kind of off the bottom and so what we can do is we can go to our simulation and then do block z ground that's going to make things kind of stick to the ground and make sure that it's actually blocking and colliding with the smoke and then that's whenever you actually start getting uh, a nice um, ground level type effect is whenever you do that um, and so now we can pause this and we can start uh, shading this a little bit and so one thing let's increase our vorticity um, a little bit to get some extra noise and then in my simulation, I'm going to make sure BFECC is on, which it is. And then in my volume node, I'm going to add some sharpening to kind of sharpen this volume up a little bit. Um, and then for my shading, uh, what we can do is we'll go into here. We're going to increase our shadow sharpness. So what shadow sharpness does is it just makes sure that you get really uh, uh, strong uh, shadows from your, your directional light. Um, and then I'm going to turn up my ambient occlusion as well. And then for my smoke tab, since I think this is too thick to actually be uh, dust, which for some reason my density clamp is at 1,000, uh, we can lower this. And so we got something like this. 
And now it's actually kind of transparent. It looks a lot more like dust. And so here we go. So that's a nice and quick little dust explosion for you or a dust shockwave. Um, and then you can make this as big as you want. You can scale up the emitter, you can scale up the bounding box. And if you need more detail, uh, you can quickly get that. And then if you wanted to set up your camera, so say something like this, and I wanted to put this in my game, you know, I might uh, uh, do something like this and kind of set it up at the top and that's probably fine. And then uh, I'd probably go into my simulation and then um, go to the combustion tab and increase my smoke dissipation. So that's gonna make my smoke fade a lot faster. And you can increase it all the way to like 100% if you want, if you want it to be a quick thing. And then we can go over here to our export image. And I'm just going to reset this and Z step. So Z uh, steps through your frames. So I'll probably like start my flipbook somewhere right here, which is frame 14. So we'll say, we'll probably just do frame 10 for the first frame. And then we can just say, okay, um, you know, tester two and then uh, export now. And there you go. There's your uh, exported flipbook. And in this case, uh, you probably want the camera to be closer uh, and you can animate the camera if you want uh, to make sure that you're filling up your texture space. And we hope to have tools in the future where you can uh, automatically crop the frame to make sure that it's uh, maximizing your texture space so that you don't have so much wasted uh, data. Um, but other than that, that is kind of how you do a shockwave. And so uh, now I'm going to go into something a little bit more exciting and we're going to um, make some fire. So let's just imagine that we want to make like a, I don't know, like a torch fire or something like that. So what we can do is I'm going to uh, maybe go and do like a capsule for like the end of a torch. And uh, maybe we'll offset this um, a little bit so we'll rotate it. And uh, then what we can do, which I don't think my scaling stuff works yet. Okay, yeah, such so is the, the life of a beta build. Um, so what we can do here is I'm going to make my length uh, maybe like 1.5. And then we can go to our radius and do maybe two. And so I think that's a pretty good size for a torch. Maybe we'll do uh, 1.5 for the radius as well. Um, so there we go. So we've got some, some pretty decent emission there. And uh, what we can do is we can actually leave. Um, so what we've got um, here is uh, we're just going to leave the uh, emitter here so that we can imagine that uh, you're not seeing all the way through the fire uh, for this particular torch. And so now uh, what we can do is go to our emission tab and we can increase our temperatures just a little bit. And I'm going to make sure that we turn off smoke emission. Uh, and so just in this case, I don't want to emit any smoke at the beginning for this. Um, we're going to imagine this is a relatively clean burning torch. Um, and then we also have a thing in the simulation node called shredding. Uh, and what that does is it takes the temperature uh, around surrounding voxels and it kind of clumps it together and it makes the temperature um, in the center of where it's kind of sampling from uh, a higher value so that the, the fire uh, rises quicker. And so we can increase our shredding intensity. You kind of see that the fire gets a little bit more violent. And so we're probably going to do maybe like 44, 45%. Um, and so now we've got some nice little flame licks there. And so uh, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to turn off my skybox. I'm going to turn off my ground <clears throat> just so that we have a black background to work on. And then in my simulation node, I'm going to uh, lower the actual um, generated smoke so that it's a lot lower here. So we're going to do like maybe 3%. Um, and so now uh, to actually shade our fire, this is kind of where the part of making it look good comes in. Um, and it does take a little bit of um, finesse and, and things like that, but I will try my best here on stream. And so one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my shaping by flames. And basically what that's doing is that is multiplying uh, against the fire channel and it's essentially making it brighter. Um, and then what we can do is we're going to check this flames uh, translucency uh, button. And what that's going to do is the uh, the thicker parts of the fire is actually going to become kind of more translucent. Um, and that's going to give you that nice like webbed uh, fire look that you often see out there in real life. Um, and so you can kind of change like your translucency level. So either you want it to uh, be more or less transparent uh, in the center. You can even do things where like you have just the very edge of your fuel uh, being consumed, that kind of thing. Uh, but in this case, we're going to kind of keep it. Uh, maybe somewhere around like the 3,500 range. And you can also change like your translucency width. And that's going to uh, kind of change how your colors are, are, are mapped to the translucency. Um, 
And then from there, uh, you can also play with your, like your, your color uh, remapping. What it's doing is it's taking this ramp and it's just changing uh, where you're remapping it to. Uh, and if you wanted to, you can do uh, like a black body uh, flames color and you can kind of change like the scale of your black body if you wanted. And then if you wanted to uh, make like an actual, um, like your own gradient, you can do that as well. So we have like a gradient. And if we wanted to, you know, say for instance, make like blue fire or something, and maybe we can like add a different color here, uh, maybe make it like, like a green or something. And so as you kind of like change this, you can kind of see the, the different coloring. And if we went to the shading node and we kind of change this around, you can kind of see how that those colors are being remapped. Um, one thing that I would like us to add is like the actual gradient to this view as well so that you can see it uh, instead of it just being in the color gradient, but that's something that we'll get to. Um, and so, yeah, so I will double click to delete that and we'll go back to our color ramp. And I think that that's uh, actually some pretty decent fire. And if we wanted to, we can go to our simulation and turn on a uh, Simulagrangian uh, instead of BFECC because that's going to give us a bit more um, soft look for the fire. And then um, uh, from there, uh, what we can do is um, we can go to our vorticity. And one thing you could do is you could lower it if you wanted to make it uh, more of a smaller scale fire, uh, maybe like a matchstick or something like that burning. Uh, but generally, you're going to keep your vorticity up. And if you do want more detail or more flame licks or whatever, um, you can use that vorticity uh, to kind of drive up those parameters. And so um, that's that on that front. And so that's kind of how you make a, a simple fire. Um, and I do have a more advanced fire project that I'm going to open here and show you. Um, let's see here. I think I need to go to my desktop, I believe. And so here we go. So there's this. And so this is a more advanced uh, fire example where we actually have like a back plate that we've imported. And now we kind of have the window on fire. And so if we wanted to, we can kind of like zoom in with this. Unfortunately, the uh, camera does not stay locked with the back plate if you um, rescale it. So we can just kind of like zoom back out, kind of replace that fire. And so this is kind of an example of what you can get uh, with some better emitters. Um, and in this case, it is running a little bit slower on my GPU because it's quite a large simulation, but it just shows kind of uh, what you can expect. So we can see here, uh, we just kind of place that over the back plate. And uh, the cool thing is, is that we want to make a full compositing workflow for Embergen. So you can bring in your back plates, whether they're static or animated. You can bring in your tracked cameras and then uh, place your simulation exactly where it needs to be. And then you can render everything out. Um, and then if you have like a mesh or uh, anything like that for your alpha, you can bring that kind of stuff in as well. And then uh, do your compositing for your simulations right here in Embergen and then do a direct render from Embergen instead of having to export VDBs or whatever and increase your render times, uh, you can just do all your rendering here inside of Embergen. That's kind of the goal. So you can see here uh, for this particular example, if we turn on our um, visuals for the emitter, we just have a couple of um, like boxes on the ground with some noise on them. And then we have uh, just some static noise uh, applied to it. And then that's our emitter shape. Um, so yeah. So we're trying to do everything uh, a bit with, you know, between like baked uh, simulation data uh, inside of our simulation nodes that kind of black box and then enough uh, control where you can really insert any kind of data or parameters that you want into that simulation node and create the, the simulations that you want. And thus far it, it's, it's worked pretty well. Um, and so other than that, uh, I will do one more example for you guys. Uh, show you how to create something. Uh, and in this case, um, we're going to show you kind of how our GPU particles work. So if you go to the volume node, there is a, uh, you have a rendering mode where you can choose between volumetric or particles, experimental and hybrid. Hybrid is you want to do both GPU particles and your volume. So if you want to add like sparks or, you know, whatever, uh, you can do that uh, in this particular node. So in this case, now we have uh, this right here. And so these are our GPU particles. And so right this second, uh, inside of our emitter is where we have uh, our additional particles uh, controls, but uh, I hope that in the future we will kind of take these tabs out and make them their own nodes. So we'll have like a, a volumetric 3D like emitter, and then we'll have a GPU emitter to kind of simplify things. Um, so from this, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to change my shading type to per particle, 
And so now we just have a bunch of uh, white, lightly shadowed particles. And uh, what we can do here is um, I'm going to try and make like some kind of crazy uh, prism thing or something like that. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'm going to make this a uh, maybe a sphere. So I'm going to make it a sphere. And then I'm going to uh, go into my pressure and I'm going to make it negative pressure. Uh, and then I'm going to go to my visuals and I'm going to turn off my emitter here. I'm actually going to increase the size of this uh, like so. And so now we kind of have uh, some, some craziness going on. And then I'm going to go into my pressure again and I'm going to uh, change the uh, pressure random seed. Um, and so that should kind of animate my stuff a little bit. And then I'm also going to go into my noise and make sure that I have animation speed. And so now we can't really see what's going on inside because our, our particles are basically like what we want is we want them to kind of fade into the scene so we can kind of see what's going on inside the, the turbulent mess that's in there. So uh, we have some pretty cool stuff here. And so what we'll do first is we're going to do um, maybe uh, cycle with time for our coloring. And we're going to expose this to the node graph and we're going to plug in a color gradient. And for this, uh, we'll do, maybe we'll do like a, uh, like an orange color, something like this. And then um, we will make it maybe blue uh, and kind of cycle between those different colors. And we can always tweak this later. And then I'm going to go into my volume node again, and I'm going to uh, make sure that this is additive. And so now we can kind of see what's going on inside of here. Um, and then I'm going to go into here and turn off my skybox and turn that off so that we can see it. And so the big problem that we want to get rid of is first off, let's increase our bounds just a little bit so that we're not hitting the edge and we, we don't have these particles kind of going off. Actually, what we can do is we can go into our simulate or particle physics, and then we can say, just kill the particles if they reach that. And then with the ground, we want to kill those too. And so that kind of solves that problem. And so now that we have this, um, we'll solve the problem that we've been talking about. So we have a modulation type, and so we can do modulation over life, and we can uh, expose this to the timeline as well, or sorry, to the node graph, and we will bring in our color. And so now, basically, where there's uh, this black color at the beginning, uh, we're basically going to say, hey, don't render those. Uh, and then where we have the white, it's going to slowly fade in. And then if we wanted to, you know, come over here and kind of kill particles uh, in the center uh, as well if we wanted to. And so you can see that this is actually changing quite a bit uh, based on this gradient. And so you can kind of change when it's fading in. And so now we have this, this crazy uh, motion here. And so uh, some other cool things that we can do with the particles is we can make them uh, velocity aligned if we wanted to. And so we can make them uh, have like a, a higher velocity scale if we want. Uh, and in this case, uh, because there's so much overdraw with the particles, it might lag just a little bit. Um, but uh, what we can do here is we can also change our emission type to something like uh, entangled. And that's going to give us uh, a lot more, um, I, I guess, cool like electric uh, shapes. And we can also lower our emission if we wanted to, uh, to try and get some better shaping in there and, and less uh, just blah on the screen. And then uh, some cool things that I, I discovered recently is if we take like a simulation like this, I, you can make it look a little bit cool if you actually do use the, the chromatic aberration. Um, and so we can actually boost this to something like maybe 500 and then we will lower our iterations or maybe increase the iterations, but lower this just a little bit until it looks pretty cool. So you have something like this and then we can go to the shading or sorry, into this particle shading and we can like boost our colors uh, if we wanted to, to make it brighter. Uh, but eventually, if you make it too bright, you're going to wash it out. We can also lower the opacity if you wanted to see through the particles a little bit better. And so you can kind of control things there. Um, and so, yeah, and you have all kinds of control over like how you're coloring the particles and what their life is and kind of what they're doing and, and you know, how they work with everybody else and <laughs> just, just all kinds of stuff. So it's pretty crazy um, what you can do. And so, uh, yeah. So uh, other than that, that's pretty much my, uh, my demo here. I can go over just a couple more little projects uh, and show you what we've done. Um, so you have the ability to do some really cool force fields. So you can, you know, uh, make like waves of smoke if you wanted to. 
um, which, so that's pretty cool. And then we also have like uh, some cool things that you can do with like stylization with our, our extra filters. So in this case, we have like a, a stylized uh, like edge embossed uh, tornado, uh, which is really awesome. And so you can see we have a couple different emitters. We have one for like the top. We kind of have one for the uh, center here. And then we have one for the bottom. And then uh, if we wanted to see uh, what that looks like without the actual filter, um, we can just look at tornado here, which is this, which the, the lighting on this is actually uh, quite nice in my opinion. Um, and so then, you know, if you wanted to amp up the detail, you can upscale this or, or whatever. Um, and then uh, one of the other ones I will show is, um, let's see, like this, this worm effect. And so in this case, this shows kind of the uh, proceduralness of how you can uh, edit your emitters. So in this case, we have a number of oscillators and then, or actually we just have one oscillator. Then we're doing a time shift on each one. So you can kind of see every time I click it, it backs up just a little bit. And so I'm just saying uh, for every little sphere that we have, we want to time shift it just a little bit so that they're just a little bit behind the one that's in front of it. It kind of creates this like snake-like uh, pattern. And then the oscillators actually controlling the uh, movement here. You can choose from noise or sine waves or, uh, you know, saw waves and random pulses and all kinds of crazy stuff to generate the, the motion that you actually want, which is awesome. And so uh, let's see if there's any other ones of, of particular interest. Um, oh yeah, this gas planet. Uh, so you could do uh, other simulations that are like kind of contained within like an inverted um, uh, collider if you wanted to. So in this case, we have a, a, a sphere shape and then we're just using a modifier to invert that shape. And then we uh, plug that into the sim node to use as a collider. In this case, we kind of have like a, a model of Jupiter, uh, so to speak. And then of course, uh, if we went over here and we went to like our simulation and we said, hey, you know, let's do uh, times two to upscale this. Um, it's going to be a little bit slower, but we're going to get a lot more uh, vortices. We're going to get a lot more crisper detail, that kind of thing. And so you can really crank those parameters up. And then whenever you're ready to render, uh, you can render that out, um, which is pretty awesome. So uh, that's pretty much my my demo here. Oh, beautiful. Oh, that's awesome work. Um, we had a question early on here, just to kind of make sure we know what we're looking at. Uh, sure. Asked, are the simulations number 10 single threaded, multi-threaded, or does it depend on it? Uh, is this GPU based? It, it's all GPU based. We do almost nothing on the CPU in this case. But for right now, we only have usage of one GPU. It's pretty hard to transfer compute shaders to multiple GPUs, um, but that is a hurdle that we want to cross uh, in the future. All right, beautiful. Um, want to make sure everybody out there knows uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have. So pop them up in the chat. We can check out questions and um, toss them here to Nick. Uh, I'm kind of curious in terms of the number of voxels we're looking at in some of these. What's our, our voxel count looking like? Yeah, so for this planet, it's like 16 million. And I think for, like, let's look, I think the biggest one that I have is this massive explosion. And the voxel count for this is 61 million. Um, and so you can go higher than that. Uh, but whenever you do, you start getting into the, uh, <laughs> you know, frame by frame uh, view. But in, at that case, it's still pretty fast because you're still seeing your final render um, and that kind of thing. So, um, but we've seen people like go up to like 200 something million voxels or more uh, on their 3090s. And we actually see some studios really, really pushing it. Um, past that level, and somehow they don't crash. But <laughs> so it, it is possible to go higher. I, I just don't put my uh, my GPU through that for streams because <laughs> in, in that case, it's a slideshow. Gotcha, <clears throat> gotcha. I mean, but, but still, though, it's like, oh no, it took two seconds a frame. Exactly oh, right. Darn. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's kind of the hope is we hope to make it so that um, like you can basically say, hey. I'm going to kind of edit this in a little bit of a lower resolution. And then for my render, I want to do ultra final quality, you know, the full, you know, 250 million or 500 million voxels or whatever. Um, and we hope to have controls like that. Um, and we have it so that like, at least with our upscaler. So like if we upscale this, I'm just going to try it real quick. Um, so yeah, so now it's 122 million voxels. Well, if you um, downscale it, maybe as opposed to trying to break your machine. Yeah. If you, if you exactly downscale right. it, how identical does it look? 
Uh, so right now you can't really downscale. Um, the okay. only thing you can do is upscale. Um, but we will probably have a, a downscaling feature in the future. Right the second, if you change your voxel size, it it basically changes the um, the container size. Um, but we want to make it so that the container stays the same. You can increase your or decrease your voxel size, um, and that will kind of increase or decrease your voxel count. Um, but the the end goal is at least with upscaling, we want to make sure that it's deterministic and it stays the same. Um, mm -hmm. because we don't re-advect the velocity. We just uh, like do like another infection pass and, and things like that to keep the simulation the same. Um, so yeah. Very cool. Um, one more sort of uh, in terms of stats here, uh, number of particles we're looking at and that's sort of uh, the Krakatoa-like nebula. Uh, so in that case, it was, um, I think four million, um, but you can go up to twenty million. And actually, my pool size was uh, four million, which means it's allocated all that to the GPU. So I could have had four million at that same uh, speed if I wanted. Uh, but we can go up to twenty million, I believe, uh, for our GPU particles. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think uh, someone beat you to the question there about um, bringing cameras into this. Uh, they answered that you can't bring FBX cameras. Yes, so you, you can bring in FBX cameras. We don't support Alembic cameras right this second mm -hmm. um, because we don't have a full Alembic integration. You can do like Alembic animated meshes, but um, we don't have support for the cameras for that. So if you have an FBX camera, you can bring that in. Um, and then, yeah, you can do all your, your work that you need for compositing right here inside of Embergen and, and export your, your render straight out the box. Beautiful. Um, one of the things... Uh, kind of reminded of um, is uh, when I first saw Bullet, how economized Bullet was with RBDs and how one of the things it was trying to do was, you know, put things to sleep and forget things as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I don't know. Uh, is there an option here for um, like auto resize to your SIM so you can control the, the domain size? So we don't have auto resizing. I'd say that's one of the, probably the major drawback of Embergen right this second, but we are currently working on sparse voxels so that you can have an infinite bounds essentially. So you can do super long trails and, and everything that you need to do in real time. And we actually think that it'll, it'll will probably be faster uh, than our, our restricted bounding box that we have right now, because right now, if you, you know, allocate, you know, five, 12 cubed uh, for your bounding box size, uh, to your GPU, it's going to be really slow. <laughs> but uh, if it's only using, it's like it doesn't matter if it's only using 64 uh, cubed in that small box. It's just going to simulate everything, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope that with the sparse voxels, um, we will get a much higher performance as well. And then one of the, the funny things is, is Embergen isn't really like that optimized yet. So we expect it to get uh, quite a bit faster. Um, and we just hired an optimization guy. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're looking at some pretty good gains here. It's already fast, but how, well, how it's fast not it? optimized yet. That's good. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see, right? And so it's pretty cool. Uh, cool. And yeah, so I'm excited for, for the future of Embergen. Yeah. So when you're getting these um, millions and millions of voxels, I'm presuming that you're working with a, a lower res velocity field, but then advecting like um, subdivided, you know, you're up resing the. Uh, uh, like temperature and smoke uh, fields. Yeah, essentially. And so, and, and we found out that that by doing that, you can keep the simulation shapes uh, in general the same and then just add extra detail uh, to like the interior of the simulation. Um, and one of the, the really cool features that we have as well uh, that I didn't mention is you can uh, loop anything with just like two clicks. So for instance, if we went into like our time control here, and we said uh, loop simulation, um, and we wanted it to be uh, like, let's say like frame 500 to frame like, I don't know, 800 or something. Um, let's see, 500. And so now we'll do this. So we'll kind of let this play out. And so now it's just going to perfectly loop the simulation between frames 500 and 800. Uh, and you can change the curve to anything you want. You can choose between like a static blend or a dynamic blend. Uh, static blend essentially takes like uh, two different caches, but the dynamic blend continually simulates to make sure that it's as perfect of a blend as it can get. And so there's no crazy tooling that you have to build or anything to get that. 
And so right now it is just uh, uh, looping perfectly. Uh, the timeline doesn't show it because we have a bug, but this yellow range right here is where the actual loop is. And so it is uh, looping perfectly. Uh, and so that, that's pretty cool that, that we have that ability. Um, that's particularly useful for, for games or, you know, if you have stuff just mm -hmm. in the background of your film and you just, you know, you don't want the 10,000 frames or which I had like double shots that long, but mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have something like that and you just want a, a quick loop, uh, you can generate those loops uh, here in Imogen very quickly too. Beautiful. Um, and thinking, you know, pipeline of going, um, uh, if this is good work for a film, it does export out to VDBs, you say? Yes. So you, you can export uh, straight to VDB uh, if you want. Um, and then you can also export to uh, like EXR, PNG, uh, TGA, that kind of stuff. We don't have support for like deep EXR yet, which I think is uh, something that the film industry uh, uses quite a bit. Um, but we, we hope to have support for, for deep EXR too in the future. And I think that the gist of deep EXR is um, you can pack like all of your channels into the same channel. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the gist um, <laughs> of what deep EXR is. Yeah, that, that's always the, um, if you want to bring your um, production to a screeching halt, start doing uh, deep rendering in your volume work. <laughs> yeah. So that's, um, but it, it does export out all the different um, AOVs. Uh, you've got a whole host of AOVs there in your, um, uh, th those go into your um, EXR, correct? Exactly, yeah. And cool. so what you would do is you would just come over here to like the, the render node, check what you want, and then uh, you can add like a, a couple nodes. And so say if you had uh, you know, like a couple more, and then the cool thing is you can just control L and it'll auto link all that for you. Nice. And then boom, you've got your, your exports ready. Um, and so, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty awesome how it works with the second. Can, can you also map out individual channels like throw in a temperature AOV or a d smoke density AOV? Yeah. And so like uh, in this case, if we go to say like our, uh, it's in the render here and we go to, which I'm gonna pause the sim just real quick here. Okay, so I'm gonna go over here and I think like my image export is like really huge or something. It's kind of lagging. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to a new project here and then do it. Um, so yeah, so if you want like temperature, um, I do believe we have that here. So you have like your temperature and then if you wanted to, you could plug that just into say the red channel of one of your uh, exports. And then if you wanted say, you know, your um, like your I don't know, like your alpha or something, you can plug that into there. So you can kind of reconfigure um, these channels, you know, any way you want and plug in anything you want and kind of pack it in whatever way you desire. And then one thing that we hope in the future is we will have like the ability to um, kind of like clone your render export setup. And if you have like, if you're like, I'm always rendering the same exact thing, mm -hmm. you could just paste in um, your particular render setup and you set your file path and your file name, and then it just does the rest and, you know, appends the proper uh, names to it and, you know, all that stuff. So that's kind of our, our goal for making it just super easy and, and user-friendly. Very cool. Um, you know, it's, this is cool. I mean, as someone coming more from the film side of things, um, it's really great to see these uh, tools made for games, how applicable they are for film work when you say, you know, I, I, I need EXRs with all this layered stuff in it. I need all this high resolution uh, kind of work. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I think one of the big things was, is that like Embergen, I initially started it specifically for games, but then we had so many people from the film industry saying, hey, can you please <laughs> like add these film features to it? And so then we actually hired like a VFX artist from the film industry and things like that. And, and we're working with him to make sure that we're kind of, I guess, uh, up, up to snuff or something like that. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, making sure that we really put in the right tools, make sure our camera tracking stuff is great and making sure all of our, our imports work really well. Um, and so we made sure that we hired somebody who had like some really good domain knowledge uh, so that we can make the tool uh, perfect for film as well. Well, I mean, the walls between games and film are rapidly disintegrating. That they are. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I uh, want to make sure we're not missing any other questions from the audience here. Please feel free to pipe up with any questions you might have. I know we have uh, E. Jason Key there is uh, 
answering a lot of the stuff for us. Um, Jason's one of our, our VFX artists, so it's cool to know that he's tuning in. I, I presumed he was not just sort of a, a random Embergen fan who's just uh, has a uh, disturbingly large amount of knowledge on Embergen. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, so in terms of a uh, future of Embergen, you already mentioned um, uh, opening up um, auto resizing of your voxel domains. Mm -hmm. um, let's see uh, what other um, features do you, I mean, I, I don't want you to promise new features and then make the audience have to uh, nag you for them. Sure. But, <laughs> yeah. But so, it, it, so, so some of our, our feature, um, we're looking at like Linux ports and Mac uh, for probably Emergen 1.0. So the big thing to note is all of this is still in beta. I mean, we, we've been working on this for uh, two years now, uh, this specific product. Um, and so this is kind of the, the culmination of two years of work uh, on our side. Well, actually more than that, because we released two years ago. Um, and so uh, from there, like basically, uh, we plan to do Linux and Mac. We plan to do sparse simulations. Uh, we want to uh, eventually incorporate a path tracer. That's probably a post 1.0 thing to get some really, really high quality scattering. And, you know, mm -hmm. like if you want to render like an ultra high quality cloudscape or something, it's kind of a, an idea that I have for things that I want to be able to do. Um, so we'll, we'll have stuff like that. Um, of course, the sparse simulations, uh, that, that's going to be coming as well, eventually. <laughs> when? I don't know. Um, and then we, we want eventually, you know, some probably a little bit more advanced compositing tools, uh, easier uh, camera imports, making sure that, say, like your lights from like 3ds Max or Houdini or whatever can import into here, too, um, to make sure that you're, you know, lighting your smoke or whatever perfectly for your scene uh, based on your scene lighting. Um, so, so things like that, just things to kind of improve the workflow. Um, I, I hope that over time, our quality will continue to get better and better um, to where, like right this second, um, in a lot of cases, I don't think we can uh, meet the, like an offline renderer's quality. Uh, there are trade-offs, but in the, I would say for probably 90% or so of your Sims, you can probably do them in Embergen. Then there's that 10% where you just need a crazy, you know, 3 billion voxel, like a line explosion or something. And then in that case, that's where you're probably going to still use something like your Dini. Um, but in well, our case, you VDBs, you can always render it in whatever other. Yeah, exactly. And, and so. so if you do need like the, the ultra high quality renderer as well, you can't just export your, your VDB and crank up the upscaling in Embergen and, and get that exported out too. So, um, but we're, we're, we're quickly closing the gap between real time and, and offline renderers. And so, we're, we're continually um, hiring more people and uh, like we just hired four people this past month. And so uh, we're, we're really getting the, the team together to uh, hit this as hard as we can and try and make real time the, the standard. So, yeah. Yeah, just the gold standard of real time. And again, from my point of view, it's like, hey, if I have to wait three seconds a frame, I'm still tickled pink over that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, compared to waiting an afternoon to run a whole sim it's like oh darn i had to wait a full minute and a half yeah, yeah and 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 i guess my thing is is like personally i'm just like ah three seconds to frame that's too long <laughs> like, we need 30 frames a second is is well, my the, goal but the but one yeah, thing that i completely understand but it's not being cached though so if it yeah. is a one second of frame sim um, do you have the option to be able to play it back in real time to examine your speed? Um, not yet, but we, we are thinking of some things where maybe we can like do a, um, like a, like a cache of just like your image. So, because you're already rendering basically the final quality that you're going to have. Um, and we, we do have some graphics options where you can do like low settings and like, it'll reduce like the, the ray marching and ray tracing and stuff and make it faster or whatever. If you have a really large sim. Um, but in general, we do want like a like a, a playback inspector that will play back at your FPS. So, um, which is another thing that we're going to have in the future that we don't have is like retiming. So, if you want like the first, you know, thirty frames of your simulation to be in the first five frames or whatever, you can retime it to be like super explosive and then kind of you know you know do whatever you want, make it ultra slow motion or whatever. Uh, so, we do have plans for like retiming and stuff, and and that kind of goes into the whole uh, 
like playback system. So just in case your sim is, you know, one frame a second uh, and you do want to see it at your final rate, we will have like a, a nice playback tool uh, eventually mm -hmm. for that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm to be able to flip book your, <laughs> your sim. And if you already have um, the blending with uh, the loops, then reincorporating that same kind of blending to retime it. Yeah. Sounds cool. Um, we have a question here. Um, is the only way to pass this into a game engine via a sprite sheet? Yeah. I mean, that, that's what we, what we currently do. Um, pretty much every game, major game studio you can think of, they already use Embergen. Um, you know, just regardless, we saw some stuff from Riot Games today, so I can say their name. Um, I won't name drop anybody else on our, on the stream, but you can look at our website at some, some of the logos and stuff. Um, but basically any game studio you can think of, they're probably using it. And we originally built Embergen for sprite sheets for games. Um, we have everything from normal maps and depth, six point lighting, um, et cetera. So uh, yeah, so it's definitely made for games and it's very easy. You can look up Embergen flipbooks uh, on YouTube and you can find the tutorial for that. Cool. Um, I have another question. Uh, are any of these simulation uh, examples available? Um, are, are these like a library of presets you can kind of begin to play with? Yes. So every single preset that I've shown on the stream today, if you have a license to Embergen, um, you can go to our Discord server and download this latest build. And we actually have all these presets in that build that we released today. Um, or if you go to our website, uh, that version has like 104 presets that you can open up to. So, um, but yeah, anything that you see on the stream, you, you can get access to. All right, beautiful. Uh, see, any further questions from the audience here? Want to make sure, uh, cool. We got Johnny Boy's question answered. Um, and I did notice a question. Somebody said, will fluid sim be possible? I think what they meant is, will liquids be possible? And the answer to that yeah. eventually is yes. We do have another product planned called Liquid Gen. Uh, in the future, no ETA. No, I don't have a demo. <laughs> so, people ask me that every stream I do. They're like, hey, do you have anything to show on Liquid Gen yet? And I'm like, nope. Um, but yeah, we, we do hope to do uh, liquids in the future too, and maybe even interact uh, the liquids and the smoke together and stuff like that too. So that's planned. So going for real time flip. Exactly. So I think real flow, but real time. <laughs> that's kind of, kind of the nice. idea there. Very cool. Uh, question came up here, uh, possibility of creating simulations from scratch. Um, if not, what programs you suggest to control movement and particles? So I'm assuming that basically a lot of these presets are, here's uh, a basic combustion uh, already set up, but you could make all of those yourself from scratch if you want. Exactly. To Every single up. preset that we made, we made it from the starter template, which is this, right? And so you can do anything you want in average, and there's nothing saying that like you and in this case like this technically is from scratch because you can't have the simulation do nothing right and we <laughs> we wanted it to be like decently okay as a starting point and you can change any perimeter you want there's nothing that we have access to that you don't have access to so um every preset that we've made is literally just a starting point just in case you want to head start or, or you want to see how we did something or or whatever um i think that one of the best ways to learn is to look at what somebody else did and figure out how they made it work. And so that's why, like, eventually, like when 1.0 is out, I want, you know, 200 or 300 different presets in the software so that you just have a huge swath and array of things to look at and just start from instead of being like, oh, I have to start an explosion from scratch again. Mm -hmm. Then you could just change a couple seeds and now you have a completely different explosion. It's kind of the, the idea behind of what we're doing with Embergen. And it makes learning easier. Like you say, you can pick through it and not have to worry about reading through the manual and exactly. the manual and, have and, to cover every angle. And, and the biggest benefit of all uh, from all this is that it's real time. So if you change a perimeter, you don't have to wait for it to sim and then render, you know, you know, five or six hours later, or 10 or however long it is, you just instantly see the result right there. And so, you know, one, one funny, I don't know if it's like a complaint, but we've had people say like in the game, it's just like, hey, my art director stands behind me and looks at it and says, change this, change this, change this, because now they can't use the rendering excuse anymore. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a, a funny thing that I've heard. Um, but yeah, so it has. Yeah, its that's drawbacks, that's, that's right? dangerous, though. You're going to have art directors behind there. What's that do? Move that over to the side. And 
So <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the double-edged sort of being able to work interactively. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. So um, uh, I'm, should I presume that we have, uh, so, oh, we have from Mr. Alex Alvarez himself here. Yeah. So saying uh, avoiding playing with uh, liquids. Um, so doing a flip sim because flip is definitely a, uh, a, a slow thing to simulate. Um, yeah. So Alex, uh, uh, giving you a shout out, you know, thank you for you guys are doing definitely. So this is um, a um, uh, also just in general, a, a great way for like you say, learning, um, you know, learning how fluids work, um, you know, with that kind of immediate feedback. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And so our, our biggest thing is just ease of use, like, that's really what we're going for with this. And that's why the UI is simple and and pretty and just everything you know we want it to be as, as easy to use as possible and you know so yeah that's kind of what we're going for beautiful uh one last question has kind of creeped up is there a um uh rendering on images a um sort of maximum size are you limited of how big those images can be uh i believe our maximum is 16k <laughs> so oh, oh well gee you need to work on that <laughs> right and so uh, now, whether or not if if you have a, a, a lighter end GPU, I don't know if you could render all 16K because that's a lot of VRAM uh, per frame. Um, unfortunately, whenever you're trying to do put the simulation and the, the textures and all that stuff onto the GPU, you're probably not going to be able to do it. But um, I, I have seen it done. I would not recommend it. <laughs> I have seen it done. And uh, yeah. And so the, the one thing I have seen it done for is uh, we did a Unreal Engine 5 uh, demo. Uh, on our YouTube channel to kind of like spice up their visual effects. And we had 16 K textures uh, for that. And so it can definitely put them out. And so if you need super uh, high res, uh, like looping flip books and stuff like that for, for unreal or, or your like movie quality cinematics in your game engine or something, you know, six, 16 K make it uncompressed and unreal. <laughs> you can get some really ultra high quality stuff uh, mm -hmm. out of Embergen by, by doing that. Beautiful. Uh, and we're getting a, a request for Celtic music to play behind this. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hook it up to a MIDI and you can automatic playing uh, a Celtic pipes in the background with this. Yeah, there you uh, go. There, there's your there's your MIDI input. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, <laughs> there you, go. you can do whatever you want, right? Beautiful. Kind of so the, the, the MIDI input lets you um, vary data based on MIDI data? Yeah, so you like you can you know hit your keys or do your synths or whatever and kind of pipe in data. I personally don't have any MIDI controllers, but we've got a couple of uh, synth type guys on our team who who love doing synths and stuff like that. That's why that's why our oscillator node is like so uh, synth like is because well that's kind of the software that they designed before they joined us. Um, but yeah, so uh, you do have MIDI stuff and you know you can do like note triggers or control change or and just all kinds of crazy controls based on MIDI input. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. If you want some really dynamic, you know, flows yeah. controlling explosions or whatever, we've, we've had some demos internally. <laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. Which I'm just do. waiting for, uh, who's me the first band to find this and be, wait, I can now do real time projection of my music. I can embody, you know, and this is basically <laughs> all the motion graphics to go behind bands. Yeah, drive it off your MIDI. It, it's funny we we've had Emerson used in in numerous music videos, but of course they just like bake it out and stuff. But mm -hmm. we've had musicians say, "Hey, can you please like make a spout input or output or whatever?" Which I think is like a music type output. And they they really yeah. want that kind of support, but I'm like, eh, it's kind of going down the road that <laughs> yeah. I'm sticking with you know your your typical visual effects workflows. But yeah. maybe it's something we'll work on in the future. I don't know. Wow, let's. Well, a any more rabbits to put out of your hat other than the MIDI? <laughs> the MIDI <mode? laughs> uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, there's just all kinds of crazy stuff and, and things, um, which actually, uh, hang on. I do have one more thing. Let, let me show you. Let me see here. All right. So hang on. I, I got to put in this like secret cheat code. Uh-oh. Okay. There you go. Sorry for flash warning, I should say that. So this is a flash warning. 
<laughs> everything you, you click on now inside of Emergen has like a super flashy uh, cheat code on it now. And so <laughs> just, just a fun cheat code that we did. Uh, so now that's out in the wild, I will not tell you what the cheat code is. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, <laughs> but, but, but it is a cheat code. And so it's really cool. Like if you, you know, come in here and we type something like it, you know, <laughs> it, it does it on the screen. So it's a cool little thing. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the only other rabbit I have. <laughs> okay. Head, so. and, and no like lightsaber sound effects to accompany that either. No, no, no lightsaber effects or anything. Um, okay. But, well, okay. well Still th cool. there, there's one more thing. Uh, we, we, we have like these, <laughs> these free Fridays where, or at least we're trying to, where we have like a cool down period. And recently in our, our previous free Friday, like last week, our team implemented the ability to load in sounds, custom sounds. So if you want to have like your sound guys have explosion effects and stuff, and you want to time your explosion or you want to time it to music or whatever, yeah. you can import a soundtrack and, <laughs> and do that. It's not in this build, but it will eventually uh, be in the build. So, yeah. Oh, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, very cool. Well, um, I don't think we can top that. I think that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, have no more um, no more questions coming in. Then uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. I really want to thank you, um, Nick, for showing us uh, Embergen. This was uh, something pretty cool. Um, hope uh, our audience can kind of get their their hands in this and see what kind of crazy stuff they can make. Um, Absolutely. Uh, let me real quick before we sign off, I want to uh, pitch our upcoming events. Uh, October 6th at 2 o'clock, we have Art Jam with Josh Herman and Alex Alvarez. Um, so uh, tune in for that. Those are cool as always. Um, and then October 7th at 10 a.m., Instructor Spotlight on Virtual Production with Dane Smith. Um, that is uh, going to be uh, super cool. Dane Smith is um, at the epicenter of the world of virtual production. So he's going to have a, an amazing wealth of knowledge to share. So, so again, that's October 7th. In, um, follow us on for all of our live stream announcements. We announce all these things. You can keep up with what's going on with Nomen. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, everybody uh, in the audience here. Um, and uh, thank you, Nick, for sharing this amazing stuff. And um, Absolutely. yeah, I, we're out. Thanks, everybody. And uh, good night. Yep. Good night, guys. Good night.